I don't know why, but I'm excited to teach about excuses today. <laughs> I have no understanding yet why, but um, if you guys that know me, it's like God gives me my sermons in the morning or he'll send me back to my archive and say, you haven't preached this. You need to preach this again. And uh, I, I just, you know, I've been doing this since 91, I think was the first time I ever preached a message. And uh, our pastor um, recognized the call on my life to be a minister. And and uh, he said, yeah, get ready. And this was on like a Wednesday or Thursday. He said, you're preaching Sunday night. I'm like, well, I didn't want it that fast. Come on now. <laughs> and then right after that, he he they had a Sunday school. So he instated me as the adult Sunday school teacher. So Drop and I, we were in our mid-20s, and our class were 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, what could I possibly teach them? You know. <laughs> and so, um, I don't know why I'm sharing this. This is going to help somebody. So in that denomination, what they did is they handed you a book, and that was your, your, your teachings for the next month or two months. And everybody had that, and we had a little book we taught out of the book. That was the most boring book. <laughs> good morning. Good to see you guys. Hey, those are our friends from Texas, man. Give them a hand clap. Gary and Yolanda, all the way in from Texas. They're members of the church. They just live in Texas. And they always uh, view by streaming and, and online. Uh, but we're always glad when they can come in. Amen. Good to see you guys. By the way, that was great barbecue last night. I'm still loving it. Amen. I got the quiz. What would you eat? A lot of protein. Just look forward. A lot of protein. <laughs> Gary's birthday was yesterday, and uh, I think he turned 103. I don't know. He's got a great plastic surgeon back in Texas. No. He's, he's ignoring me over there. Anyway, God bless you guys, man. It's good to have you. Amen. So, so back to my, my booklet before I lose this train of thought. And he ups me. <laughs> yeah, I ate till I was miserable last night. But we had this booklet. And, and I, I would go over it and I would study it all week. And so I could be effective and, and teach and, and edify the people on Sunday morning. And the more I studied that book and the thoughts of the theologian and the doctor that wrote the book, the more disgusted I got. I was like, my Lord, what do I do? So I just started just opening the Bible. And so we would have a passage and I would just let's just turn it, turn the Bible to that passage and read it for ourselves. I was amazed at how many verses they left out in that passage. And so my pastor sit at the back of the class and he just sit there smiling the whole time. Week after week after week, he just smiled. Finally, I asked him one day, I go, why are you smiling, Pastor? He goes, I just love to hear you teach the word. I go, but why are you smiling? He goes, I think it's funny. He says, because, you know, you're given a teaching and they expect us as a denomination to follow it. But he says, you know what? You're bringing an expansion of what they should have given to us in the booklet. So I said, well, would you be opposed if I got rid of the booklet and, and just talk straight out of the word? He went, no. So the next Sunday we had our booklets, had everybody hold up their booklet. And I said, you know your booklet? Just throw it over your shoulder right now. We're going we're gonna to teach the Bible. They threw them to the back. My pastor was busting up back there. And from then on, I started teaching the Word of God that would help people move forward in life. Amen? It brought life to them. See, there's, there's a place where we have to have solid doctrine. But that doctrine needs to be inspired so we can live it out Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday. Does that make sense? Because if doctrine doesn't help us in our daily function and keeping us aligned with truth, what good is it? Amen? It's just a bunch of thoughts of man. And so uh, out of that, I became a teacher of Paul's teachings. Is what they described me, a Pauline-type teacher. And I don't know, he just makes sense to me as a, as a leader in the, in the New Testament. And um, so this was my personal evolution. Now, yours may be different. And that's quite all right, because none of us are all the same in here. OK, but I can assure you one thing along this journey, you got plenty of excuses. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
I had all kinds of excuses. Some that I had created and some that people were giving me. So, you know, excuses are kind of like trash cans. We all have a couple of them and they all stink. Do we agree? Amen. I'm still trying to figure out what is recyclable and what isn't. I don't know about you. They write it on there. I still can't figure this thing out. Then I go to Starbucks and they recycle. And it's like, why did you give me two holes? Just give me one. Right? It's confusing to me. And this is what I find. If we're a person that is given to excuses, the end result and the fruit of it is confusion. Have you ever encountered somebody that's so confused they don't make any sense? It's because that's a soul that's excused themselves so many times they have no purpose in life. They have no direction for their life. And they have very little knowledge or insight that they can give anyone other than an excuse. Amen? That's pretty hard, huh? But it's truth. Right? This is what I have found. And thank you for tuning in to One Word Now broadcast. I'm Pastor Dr. Darren Goodman. And over the years, this is what I have found. We live by too many excuses and too few profound truths. We live by too many excuses and by too few of profound truths. If you're in a state of confusion, there's only a couple of things you really need to know to clear your vision. Number one, is Christ loved you so much He gave His life for you and went to the cross to redeem you. Number one. Number two, God loves you so much that He gave His only Son for you. And number three, your family loves you so much, that's why they've stuck with you over all these years. Amen? And with those three things, you can rebuild anywhere. Anywhere you go in life. No matter what bad patch you hit, knowing those three things, you can always be rebuilt and equipped and move forward. Beyond pain, shame, and trauma. Too many times we allow those three things to take us off of our race in this thing called life. And they feed excuses. Hello? They feed excuses. Amen? Isn't it sad that church has become the place of comparing who was most dysfunctional? Who created the most sin? And then we want to waller in the testimony of it? Those aren't testimonies. Those are just tests and moanings. Right? Because the testimony talks about His salvation, His character being realized to me, His endowment, His empowerment, His dunamis power working through me that literally recreated me, made me brand new, and set me on a new course of life. Amen? If you dabble in your trash long enough, you'll get trashy. You'll be a dump stir. Amen? That's a heavy revy. You might want to tweet that one. I'm serious. We moved not long ago, and people was out digging in our trash. I'm like, people, you don't want what's in there. They were even taking the paper. So then I freaked. I'm like, what kind of paper did you throw out? Was that our bank statements, our broker statement? What was in that bag? Amen. They were hauling off like Santa Claus. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, what are they possibly doing with it? And my wife, she's so brilliant. She's like, the heavens opened. I saw a cherubim and seraphim. She, I hear this, oh. And she goes, they're recycling. I'm like, of course they are. <laughs> Excuses can cost us. But let me tell you something. There is freedom from it. I don't know about you. There's... Um, we always have to guard ourselves from this. Watch what Jesus said. Go with me to Luke chapter 14, verse 16. Luke 14, verse 16. Is this good so far? Huh? I don't know about you. I love going to church. I've been in all types of churches, preached in all types of churches all over the world. But one thing I like about going to church is learning something. Hello, I'm not good for foo-foo church. If I need to be entertained, I'm going to go see you two, Right? Come on now, Sammy Hagar, Bon Jovi, right? Adele, come on now, right? We've made the sanctuary God a place of entertainment instead of the place of instruction, instead of the place, place of understanding, the place of endowment or impartation. And we as the people of God have settled for it. Amen? 
I like our pastor. You showed up at church without a notepad. You were rebuked. He didn't say good morning. He'd say, where's your Bible and your notepad? It's in the car. Might want to get it. Or somebody said, well, it's in the car. My excuse. He's like, you might want to get that. Yeah. The reason being, he was in the business of equipping people for their future, their destiny. He had no tolerance for people dealing with a slack hand or excuses. So I learned a lot from him. Received a lot of rebukes from him. But watch what Jesus says here. Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast. Circle that because so many times we get caught up in thinking God did everything. Not here in this passage. It says clearly a man prepared a great feast. Now, ladies, you ought to give right now. Give me an offering for this revelation. A man prepared a great feast at your house. <laughs> Amen. All the ladies are, get them, pastor. Sick them. Right? Look at this. A man prepared a great feast. A great feast. Not just a feast. A great feast. Now, this is something that the Goodman household's working on. If you come to our house, we'll look at you real sober, real transparent, with no pretense and go, are you hungry? And if you say yes, we'll go, the refrigerator's right in there. And over there's the cupboard. Are you thirsty? Over there's some bottled water. And sometimes people get taken back by this. It's just we're not good at that hospitality type thing in helping people, you know, eat and all that. Now, coffee, different story. You come to my house for coffee. It's a, an event. Amen. So. Um, but we need to learn this drop, put this in your notes of being preparers of a great feast. Amen. A great feast. Do You hear me. When somebody comes to your home, they should know you've prepared a great feast. Now, I'm not just talking dinner here. I'm talking conversation. Hello. I'm talking fellowship. Amen. I'm talking when you sit down with people, you welcome them into your home, invite them into your home. You know, you should want to conania with them. You should want to fellowship with them. There should be an interchange of ideas and conversation and insights. It should be edifying instead of, uh, you know, death-defying. Yeah. Does that make sense? So here it says, a man prepared a great feast. Too many times as Christians, as us faith people, we always think God's going to do it. Yeah, God has done it. God will do it. His promises say that. But I'm also here to tell you, you're going to cooperate with God. And here it says, man prepared a great feast. Amen? Look at this, moving on. And then he sent out many invitations. What are we really in the body of Christ? We're inviters. We're inviting people to understand God's word. And in the understanding of his word, they get greater wisdom for daily living. We're inviters, taking them to Jesus and inviting them to meet somebody that has the power to change their life. We're inviters. Amen. Early on, uh, when I was a part of the church, uh, we used to go door to door with flyers and with, with Bible tracts. And we, we thought we'd just messed up if nobody received Jesus Christ at the end of the evening. And then we had to keep count of how many houses we went to their doors. All of this was driven. All this was based on performance. All this was to get results. Push, 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 push. And I started to realize it's not, it doesn't come by pushing people. It comes by inviting people. So we flipped the switch on that. Talked to our pastor. We said, you know, we don't understand why we're pushed to give Bible tracts. Well, they'll read them, then come to church. And we started to put together. What if we just invite them to church? And I saw our little tiny country church explode, literally, where there was standing room only, inviting people, being kind, being there and listening, being there and helping. Does that make sense? Extensions of love and hope in the community. It was amazing. Standing room only. Yeah. Let's move on. Verse 17. When the banquet was ready... 
He sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. Look at that. Verse 18. But they all began, and here's the key, making excuses. You know, excuses have to be created. Excuses have to be made. Excuses have to be put together. It's segments of thoughts chain linked together to give an outcome. And most of the time, they're lies. Think about that. This is why the Scripture is so clear about taking every thought captive and submitting it to the obedience of Christ. When you take a thought captive, submit it to the obedience of Christ, guess what? It has the power to change you as an individual. But when you allow thoughts just to harbor, thoughts just to hang in there, thoughts just to create new thoughts of themselves, guess what? My question would be this. Who's in charge, you or the darkness of your mind? Hello? Who's in charge there? You or the enemy trying to seed a thought into your mind? Who's the gatekeeper over your soul? You or the enemy? Who's in charge of your next breath? Oh, God is. No, really, you are. He created your body as a backward vacuum. (sighs) Does it normally? We didn't even ask God's opinion on it. Why? These are things He instated when He created you. When He created human beings that your lungs would function properly. Do you hear me? Are you getting this? This is yes in here. This is no. Amen? Think about this. If you had to think every moment of the day, I have to exhale. (laughs) Now I have to breathe in. (gasps) You would hyperventilate. Especially when you had a couple cups of coffee. (laughs) You'd walk around with a bag on your head. Right? Right? But when it comes to excuses, we think, oh no, they're valid. There may be a valid excuse. But if all you ever give people when you're pushed with the demand is an excuse, chances are they're not valid. Chances are somebody's confused. Chances are somebody's listening to the wrong intel. Amen? Let me give it to you like this. This is straight up fresh. Excuses are the seeds of procrastination. Excuses are the seeds of being double-minded. And this kind of creature, God says, don't let them think they'll receive anything from Him. They're unstable in all that they do. See, Excuses are the seeds of instability. If there's anything the church in North America needs to become is stable. Oh, amen. Preach it, pastor. It needs to be stable. Amen? Something you can sink your teeth into. Something that you can be a part of. Something you feel excited to be united with. But whenever it has more freaking things going on than 21 theaters over here, come on, somebody's confused. And we're eating that fruit. Amen? We're here to strengthen one another, to edify one another, to align one another with the truth, and to be inspired with what Christ gave to us so we can literally be on fire to reach out into the community. Amen? You know, they don't care if you're word of faith. They don't care if you talk in tongues. They don't care what you label you want to wear. All they want to know is... What you have, will it change my life? And you can never go wrong by giving a person Christ. I like what our pastor used to say. When you go internationally, preach Jesus. Just preach Jesus. Because you know what? It all starts and stops with Jesus. If you think about that. The rest follows. Amen? I always like it. What kind of church are you? I I don't know how to explain you people. I really, I'm just being transparent. For our, for our, our guests, this is just normal, okay? <laughs> They're probably thinking, oh God, he, somebody slid something in his coffee. No, I'm just jacked up like this. Well, I don't. People always ask, what, what kind of church are you? I'm like, well, we're definitely not one with a steeple on it. One time I said, well, we're in a strip mall. The lady looked at me like, you are? 
<laughs> How else are we going to get money coming into this thing? No. <laughs> she looked like me, you know, strip mall. Her mind, you couldn't be. I had to explain what a strip mall was. True story. I, I'm, I'm serious. I came from Farmersville. I don't claim to have a lightning fast mind, but I figured that one out. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't mean it like that. It, it, we're in a, a center, like a shopping center. Oh, okay. See, many times when people ask what kind of church you are, their brain is already fabricating an excuse of why not to come and fellowship with you. That's why I give them a broad spectrum of A to Z. We're Baptists. We're Pentecostals. We're Word of Faith. We're Catholic. They're like, all, we're, yeah, we're, we're, more, we're more than a man. That's right. <laughs> we're, we're from all walks of life. But I said, we have this common denominator. We love Jesus Christ and receive His salvation. And we're filled with the power of God. And we see the Bible enacted in our church and in our lives. I think your friend asked me. I, so with him, I said, um, you know, we're somewhere between Baptists and, and Assemblies of God. I've had those Bible scholastic scholar types go, well, you don't know what you are. I went, that's not a bad thing these days. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> like if we totally know what we are, we can lay it down. But you know what? What you want to know is do we believe the Bible and teach it? Yes, we do. Amen? Excuses. Let's get back on this. Look at this. Verse 18. But they all began, look at that. When one starts... The community, or not the community, the, the multitude always follows. Be careful what you let out your mouth. <laughs> yeah, I should be like, be careful what you let out your mouth there. Because here's what tends to happen. If you speak the wrong thing, people grab it and run with it. You ever been in a crowd, you said something, somebody heard it, and it became something totally different? Ever played the game where we're going on a trip, and you're whispering? By the time it gets halfway around the room, it's like, what trip are we going on here? Right? It changes. Well, this is what happened here. Invitation goes out. It's a beautiful banquet. Man prepared a great feast. And all men do. Hallelujah. All real men do. Isn't that right, Gary? That dude can cook barbecue right there like nobody's business. He has a secret recipe, and I'm going to get it out of him one of these days. Maybe if we fly, I'll just tip upside down. What is it, Gary? What is it? What is it? <laughs> he, that was good. Look at this. And it goes on to say, but they all begin making excuses. See, when one has an excuse, people will gravitate, gravitate to that. It almost becomes like an unholy anointing for you know what? Everybody's living in an excuse. Amen? This is something Drop and I are really sharp on with each other, is no excuses. If you're not going to do it, just say you don't want to do it. But don't give me 51 reasons why you're not ready to do it. Just yes and no. Right? So it makes it real, real clear, real clean cut. Verse 18. And one said, I have bought a field and must go and inspect it. Now, Mandy, you're in real estate. The two of you in Elba. Have you ever met anybody that bought anything without inspecting it first? They looked at it on the Internet. If low level, they live out of the area. Or they go and touch the soil for themselves and the house. Right. Then they even bring in an inspector to inspect it. Pre-buy inspection. So if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have looked at this nitwit and went, dude, you're just lying. Right? Look, he bought a field and he must go inspect it. That was his excuse. So he did ask, please. So he's a gentleman. Please excuse me. Verse 19. Another said, I've just bought five pair of oxen. He bought ten cows. And I've got to go try them out. Why would you buy a cow without trying it out? I don't know about you, but if I bought a milk cow, she better give milk or she's going to be a steak. Right? This guy, if we go back to the historical time, oxen were used because they were strong, uh, part of the, the species of cows, and they were our cattle. They were strong. They pulled things. They plowed things. They, they you know... It was kind of like the modern day Ferrari, especially if I had two of them out front. You're like, you're really going to town fast. <laughs> two times as fast. 
So this man has bought five pair or ten oxen, and he's got to try them out. And he asked, please excuse me. The next one, number 20, uh, verse 20. And this one said, I now have a wife. Just look forward, man. So I can't come. I understand that one right there. <laughs> Just <laughs> he says, I now, I now have a wife. So I want to know, did they were they dating and just got married? Or all of a sudden now this lady that's along his side, he's seeing her in the wife capacity to where she has input. <laughs> Come on now. See, dating's one level of relationship. Marriage is another. When you get ready to get married, get ready. You're going to be enjoined with another individual and you're going to have a lot of dialogue and communication. Mm-hmm. Some of it challenging. But hopefully it's all to mobilize you in the right direction, right? So his excuse was, I now have a wife. Let me give you some insight, you single men tuning in. When you're single, you do what you want to do when you want to do it. Once you say, I do, that changes for the better. For the better. So you just don't do what you want to do, and she doesn't get to do what she wants to do when she wants to do it. She's at your beck and call, but you're exempt of it. No, no, no. This is two becoming one flesh. So, you know, you used to just go play golf when you wanted. Now you need to confer with headquarters. Right? Now you need to find out if it's the right timing before you make that purchase. I love this new miracle. Well, I don't know who she thinks she is. We got married. Oh, so she's trying to tell me how to run my checkbook. I'm like, check this out, chump. If you want a marriage that'll go longer than a year, you both better be understanding that checkbook. If not, she'll get it all in court. Trust me. <laughs> but see, this man made that an excuse instead of that to be something to cherish. He could have said something like this. You know, I just recently got married and uh, we have other things to do. But thank you for the invitation. Right? He could have even said this, you know, my wife, she doesn't like you that well. So. <laughs> she has many more benefits than you. When I had a bunch of golfing buddies that liked to, you know, golf and then they would go to the 19th hole and, and continue golfing, looking for a hole in one. Let me just be plain. There was a day when I said, you know what? I'm not going golfing with you anymore. They asked me why. They gave me all kinds of names. I learned I had other names other than Darren. Henpecked was the nice one. Okay, It just went from there. And I, I finally got to a point. I said, you know what, guys? Let me just make it real clear. I'll go golf with you as long as my wife gets to be my caddy. Oh, well, well, no, no. We don't want any women. Why? I'm married. You're not. You don't want any women around? Well, that's not what happens at the 19th hole. You're always trying to get women around. So I said, I can't golf with you anymore. Well, why? And so they started calling me all these names. I said, no, I just value my wife and this relationship we're building and the family we'll build more than I value you. Thank you. And if our friendship comes at that level, then that's all it's worth. Can I tell you, those men have all been divorced no numerous times. And they're scattered like chaff. See, make good choices and they'll pay dividends for an entire lifetime. Amen? Amen. My wife's the best golfing buddy I ever had. I still don't understand why she thinks she needs to throw her golf club into the pond. I'm like, no, honey, we try to get balls out of there. You don't throw your clubs in there. That was a long time ago, like 20-something years ago. She told me if I tell her st if stories like this, I have to preface how long ago that was. I took her out. I thought, I'm going to teach her how to play golf. Don't ever do that. Just hire a teacher. She went out there expecting to be like Jack Nicklaus. After a couple of times with the ball going that far and that far, she took that golf club and wrapped it upside a tree. Then she hit our golf cart with it. I'm like, stop, woman. She's going crazy on the first hole. We got 18 more of these. I was 
my lightning fast mind was going, I could be killed by 18 toll. The one time she just helicoptered it. <laughs> no, the ball's supposed to go that way, honey, not the club. It's a true story. She was exciting to play golf with. This is Viking style golf. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go out there, you got your nice golf shirt on and nice slacks and nice shoes. She shows up with this Viking helmet. It's like, this is a Viking golf. Amen. You ask for a beef sandwich, she goes and kills the cow and brings it back to you on the 19th hole. Amazing stuff. Let me give this to you. Excuses. An excuse in the Greek is this word. Perahi teomiaho. If you can say that three times, you are, chances are your charismatic spirit filled. Amen? It's para he, to he, omahi. I can't even get it straight. And I wrote it. Okay? All I know is it's very long and confusing like an excuse. Right? Here's what it means. It means to, put, to beg off, to deprecate, decline or shun or avoid, refuse or reject. We could summarize it by saying it like this. X, C, use. Break the word down like this. X, C, and use. When people give an excuse, here's what they're really saying in their mind. I want to exit, to see, and not to be used. When people give you an excuse, they want to exit the situation to see, but not to be used. An excuse. Amen? Nothing more, nothing less. If you're in a business where you're hiring uh, or training employees or you're recruiting a sales force or you're putting together team members, know this, excuses you cannot afford. They will bankrupt your company. When you sit down with somebody and you share an opportunity and the only thing they can give you is excuse after excuse after excuse, they're not worthy of the opportunity. Close your book up and just say, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Do you hear me? You'll waste too much time with people that are led by excuses instead of people that are doers. Amen? Put this in your notes, please. Distractions will keep man from being involved with God and connecting to his church. The church has a purpose in the earth. Or Jesus would not have gave his life for people and he certainly wouldn't have commissioned the disciples to build this thing called a local church. But people have excuses as to why they don't join one or get involved with one. And if it's from pain, shame, or misuse and abuse of your past, hey, look around the room who hasn't been. Let's get free from these excuses and we can be then a healthy partner with a local church. More importantly, we may find that we benefit even greater by being involved in a fellowship or connecting with others through the local church. Amen? If I had to tell you I liked everything my pastor said, I'd be the world's biggest liar. There are many things he said to me I didn't like. But it didn't mean they weren't truthful. Amen? If I told you every time I went to church that, you know, blessed Betty shook my hand the right way and made me feel like a champion, oh no! But I looked beyond it. Because I understand this. We are all people that make up the body of Christ. We all have our little hang-ups, sometimes a schism, and sometimes just bad days. But I've got to get a bigger vision. Bigger understanding as to why I'm a part so I can be an active member of the body of Christ. Globally and locally. Amen. Now, with our online church, there's people that don't find a church in their community similar to ours or where they can't have that connection or haven't made that connection yet. That's why we go to great lengths to stream this broadcast every week. That's why we're on television. It's to get the message to places we can never walk on our own two feet. Does that make sense? The reason being is we want to eliminate every excuse. Amen. Moving on. Look at this. Put this in your notes. The feast was ready when the invitation was sent out. It's ready right now for you. 
Sometimes you're thinking, well, God's preparing. So, well, it's so big. No, you know, I understand that it kind of charges us and keeps our mind in the game. But let us understand it is a finished work in Christ. It is done. You are approved. You are accepted. You are stamped with his stamp. You are sealed in the beloved. Amen? Yeah. And God created a future for you that you are to live out. And it will have everything in it you need. And we have to settle that once and for all. If not, excuses literally will rob us of what God said is available to us. Amen? Moving on. Can you take some more? Look at this. The guests created their own excuses. They fabricated them. It wasn't Jesus. This is a parable, and the guests created their own excuses. Next, two excuses were based on essential purchases. Is it wrong to own land? No. Is it wrong to own oxen? Yeah, if you're my household. I don't want any cows. I just want to go and buy it at the store after it's taken care of. Right? But think about this. If you're a farmer and a rancher, what's cows to you today? It may be a new tractor. Maybe a new, new till. It may be utensils to cultivate that land. Tools that are essential. So these aren't bad purchases. And I find today, you know, when people are making purchases and they're believing God for increase to make the purchase for the car, the house, the furnishings, or for the clothes for the children, those aren't bad. Just don't allow them to become an excuse. Amen? And certainly never allow a purchase to stand between you and God. Never. And now just put down on the notes, he's El Shaddai, not El Cheapo. Because we can get in that ditch to where, oh, God don't want to bless me. So he knows it would be between me and him. Shut up. That's for people in TV land, not here. Shut up. Stop that nonsense. God wants to lavish you. He wants to bless you. Amen. If you were the father... Would you rather have your children excited and happy in life or always belly aching? I can answer that one. Right? So God wants to bless you. He wants to grant things to you and give things to you and bless you in this walk called life. It's not wrong to have nice things. It's been said 100,000 times. It's wrong to have nice things having you. Right? That's all. Here's how you know. Here's a good acid test. Here's an excuse killer. If you have something nice, right, and God tells you to give it, if you have to think twice, that thing better be doubly gone. And if you can live that kind of life, guess what? God will bless you coming and going. You'll have nice things, and once it leaves, nicer things show up. This is the system and a law God put in the earth. Amen? Yeah. Moving on. When choosing a spouse, remember this. You view them by television. Because one of them was the excuse of a spouse. Remember this. They'll either draw you closer to God or further away from His plan for your life. It's real simple. Get rid of the thought, I'm going to marry Him and change Him. Stop it. Not happening. Right? Don't be deceived in this way of thinking. I like the ones that say, I'm going to win him to Christ. Oh, no, you won't, honey. Chances are it doesn't happen that way. Few, very few times it happens. Amen? Put this in your notes. Responsibility and prioritizing is a sign of maturity at whatever age we are. I know older people, they give excuses and stop prioritizing prioritizing their life and i know younger people that are in the same boat see a sign of maturity is priority prioritizing amen if we say we want responsibility in the kingdom of god it comes to people that know how to prioritize their time because jesus doesn't waste it he told the disciples follow me he didn't ask their opinion he didn't ask if they wanted to go to that destination. He said, follow. He didn't even look back. He went and started trekking. Right? And this is how it is with God. We as pastors sometimes need to learn this. When the Holy Spirit says, we're going that way, you don't need to ask 50,000 questions. You need to go that way. And it's amazing how we'll all come into view on the journey. Amen? 
That's good preaching, no matter if you are a Baptist. Watch this. Excuses can be a hard issue, not a conflict of schedule. Determine when it's a hard issue and get free from it, right? Here's the reason. It's rejecting the engagement because of the loss of self when being involved with another person. Did you get that? It's the rejecting of the engagement because of the loss of self when being involved with another person or the other person. People give an excuse because when they say yes to you, it means commitment. It means they may not get to do what they want to do when they want to do it because now all of a sudden there's another individual that has input. That's called engagement, right? Does that make sense? Put this in your notes. I'm going to give you some more verses. I've got to start moving on here. We all feel important when we receive the invitation. But we see greater pain in the commitment to the invitation than fabricating an excuse. Think about that. We all feel important when we receive the invitation. But we see greater pain in commitment than fabricating an excuse. I was going to put lie in there. Because they usually go hand in hand. It's amazing how excuses turn into little white lies. And I like what my pastor used to say to us. We had this slang. Oh, it's just a white lie. He went, None of them are white. They're all black and they'll send you to hell. They're sin. Because we said, well, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a pure little white lie. No, it isn't. It's black, dark, wicked sin. Okay, pastor. We're sorry. Right? Think about that. You know, the lies that will send you to hell are those white ones. Seriously. I don't know what my family call them white lies. Those will send you to hell. Amen? Moving on. Put this in your notes. The feast that Jesus was speaking of is for our benefit. Blessing and connecting. The feast is to benefit us. It's to what? Bless us. And then the key is connect us. Amen. You know, this thing about potluck at church. The idea behind it was to connect people so they would eat together. You know, the big statement, I, I, I can't stand this term when I hear pastor. We're breaking bread. Don't break my bread. Just slice it. They said, we're breaking bread. In their mind, it's pastor slang for we're communicating. We're in a relationship together. Oh, no. No. Uh -uh. I, I have some pastors who want to break bread. I, I don't break bread. I slice it and butter it and eat it. Because I don't like slang sometimes. Because I think it's a fallacy when they're not there to have dinner with you or lunch with you and relationship with you. They're just haphazardly wanting to get together with you. Yeah, you don't have time for that nonsense. Amen. Look at this. Put this in your notes. Get to know new people in your life. Get involved with others. When was the last time you walked up to somebody in a Starbucks or the supermarket? and said, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? What brings you here? I know these are very difficult questions, so you might want to write them all down. <laughs> True. I understand. <laughs> When's the last time you expanded your reach? Received new ideas? Got new info? Oh, bless God, all I ever do is read the Bible. I know, that's, that's commendable, that's noble. But sometimes Discovery Channel could help you. Sometimes you may need to just see what other countries, how they function, so that you can take that gospel and that word you're reading and be able to set it perfectly into that community, that group of people, that culture. Does that make sense? Connect with others for future endeavors. We all believe in God that He wants to give us the desire of our heart and that He wants to put us into a blessed land that flows with milk and honey. We're just not willing to talk to people and find out if they know where it's at. Right? Look at this. 
future endeavors. You know, no. Sometimes you may be sitting by the person that's looking for an investment to finance your dream. You don't know. Drop was sharing a story with me on the way to church. Oh, I never hit the start button. By the way, it's only 1130. I guess we could start right now. No. Anyway, she was telling me about a lady she saw that wanted to go scuba diving. But the challenge she had was she was handicapped. She was confined to a wheelchair. So they restructured, I guess, her wheelchair to where she could literally go scuba diving in her wheelchair. See, these kind of people intrigue me. The reason being, they don't understand excuses. When I was down on the desert a couple weeks ago, I flew down there and saw a client. I stopped over to get gas, and um, a guy met me and was excited about my airplane because his dad had one just like it. And he says, you know, I don't believe this because our, our plane is very unique. You don't ever see it, you know. Richard, would you stop socializing? You're just so social. <laughs> Good to see you, Richard. <laughs> if you know Richard, well, you that's a joke. I started golfing with Richard because he's calmer. I couldn't golf a Viking chick over here. <laughs> She's deadly. <laughs> Anyways, back to the airplane story. Watch this. So he was excited about our plane because our, our airplane is, it, there's few of these types or model of aircraft. And they, in, they've been in a trend over the last six months or so. We bought ours at the right time. And, and so when they see them, people walk up to it and they always ask you questions about it just because the structure is different than what they're used to seeing in the Cessna model of planes. And so his dad had one. So I can tell you, I've seen two in Fresno. One a friend of mine owned and it left, I think it's in Florida now, and ours. And so it's very common. People come up and ask me questions about our airplane. And so this, this young man was, and so he said, hey, there's another one over here i got to show you. It's just like yours. I went, okay. So he drove me over there, and he's, the man has it for sale. Get this. Here's God. He has it for sale for three times what we paid for ours. Wow. How would you like to own an asset that you bought in September, and already it's worth three times what you paid? Pretty cool, huh? So I said, well, tell me about this. He goes, oh, Darren, this plane, what's unique about it is there's rudder pedals that you work with your feet, have extensions, and you work them with your hands. I'm like, what? Why? He said, the man that owns it's handicapped. He can't use his legs. He's owned it for years. He wanted to fly so bad that the excuse of not being able to work the rudder pedals with his feet wasn't big enough. So he had them manufacture these, these arms that go, or these extensions that go down to the rudder pedals, and they're up here on his yoke. So yoke, you know, you, when you're flying, you turn your yoke, and you go right and left, right up and down. Well, to keep your tail straight, to keep your tail straight, you got to use your feet. It sounds strange, I know. If your tail sideways, you're not ruddering enough. Hit your neighbor and tell him that. Your tail's kind of. And so what this guy found out is he had engineered so this, this, these extension rods so he could rudder his airplane. Imagine that. Now, your airplane, you steer with your feet when you're on the ground. So if he didn't have this type of idea... His plane would never leave the hangar. Do you hear me? Could it be that we are impeding God's progress in our life because we're seeing it as a huge problem and therefore we fabricate excuses when all God's trying to say is, I'm going to change the way you step and win. Instead of maybe stepping with your feet, I'm going to use your hands to do some things that will unlock the future to you. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we get caught in an old method so stuck in it, cemented in it, that God can't do the new thing in our life. Amen? So the moral of the story is if your butt sideways, rudder it. Amen? 
Moving on. That preach is real good. Matthew 13, 12. Look at this. Is this good so far? Visitors, is this pretty good? Enjoying it? Look at this. Verse 12. Jesus said this. To those who listen, and that's the key. Your listeners. Your listeners. To those that listen, watch. To my teachings. Drup said it earlier. You have to be careful what you hear and listen to. The teachings of Jesus are great. I'd start right there. Amen. Look at this. More understanding will be given. You want wisdom and understanding? Study what Jesus taught. Study Proverbs and Psalms. You'll gain great understanding. He goes on to say this. And they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little they understand, it will be taken away from them. We that are church, we've been in church long enough, we better take this and tattoo it on the inside of our eyelids. Because sometimes we know so much, God Himself can't teach us something new. Do you hear me? Verse 15, Jesus goes on to say, For their hearts, the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes. Not the enemy, not the devil, not ten types of demons. They themselves close their eyes. Look at that. They close their eyes so their eyes cannot see. They're not blind. They just shut them in refuse of truth. Amen? And their ears cannot hear. Look at this. And now, look at the condition. And their heart cannot understand. Why do we have so many Christians that don't have an understanding heart? It's because they first close their eyes, now their ears don't even function, and now their heart does not even understand. They need an awakening of Holy Spirit. And I'm talking from leader down, or leader up, however we, we should look at it. Amen? And this is a condition of a heart, a hardened heart. Amen? Verse 16, But blessed are your eyes. Right there where it says yours, put your name in your Bible. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. They're functioning just as God intended. Why? Because your heart's soft, it's flexible, it's pliable. It gives conception to the ideas of God. It has a, a, an ability to hear, but more importantly, it wants to instate that that it's received into daily living. Does that make sense? Put this in your notes. Few people ever count the cost of a hard heart, stubborn attitude, or rejection of truth. If they understood the impact of it 10, 20, 30 years later, they probably would get real soft in their heart to receive and be trained and taught. Matthew 12, 35, I like this verse. A good person produces good things from their treasury of good heart. This translation says. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Our heart determines our output. Does that make sense? Put this in your notes, please. Always keep an attitude to learn and an eagerness to put in practice what we've received. Always. Colossians 1, 29. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which works mightily within me. We always talk about the power coming upon me, but what about the power that's working within you? Amen? There's a power of God, deutimous power of God, that when we receive understanding, it has the power to change us, power to break us through, power to literally make us mighty concerning our adversary. Amen? And Paul talked about this to Colossia, the Colossians. Philipp Philippians, look at this. He writes, in uh, chapter 3, 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but this one thing I do. You don't always need ten keys to prosperity. Sometimes it's the one key that you need. Amen? Hear me right now. I've heard the prosperity message taught so many different ways and so many different times, but I'm always eager to hear, is it that one key that I will hear this time that will change everything in my life? 
I've heard about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the teachings of them, the different types of spirits, their application. But it's this one time I'm expecting to hear maybe a greater insight that will release that gift in my life to a greater magnitude. Amen? Do you hear me? Whatever it be, the topic of marriage, communication, child rearing, whatever it be, always have an eager heart to say, you know what, I'm ready to learn. God's going to share something new and fresh with me today. Amen? When I go to church, I'm going to hear something maybe for the first time. Amen? That's why we don't have the know-it-all church around here. We're all learning. I've had people, well, you know, when I read it in the Hebrew or in the Greek, I get so much more out of it. You can't even live it in the English. Shut up with that nonsense. I'm serious. I do with people in all walks of life, all different backgrounds and when they tell me this i ask them well do you live it in the english i kind of get that farmersville stupid look i'm serious i love to see different words in hebrew and in the greek i do i gave you one earlier but let me tell you something god's not asking me to live my life in the greek he's asking me to live my life so i understand it and can produce things for his kingdom amen Does that make sense? Number one is being a good husband. That's so hard these days. Amen? Being a good father. Wow, what a noble cause. What about a good brother in the body? Wow. Come on. What about a a good business person that actually has integrity? Wow. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, And reaching forward to what lies ahead. Most of us right there would hit the dream God has for us or the vision. If we just learn to forget the past. Don't give an excuse. Because when you give an excuse, you rearm that thing to work against you. When you give an excuse, guess what you do with an excuse? You literally bind that mishap to that other individual. We're called to be freedom people. Not binders. We took the keys of binding and loose and used them on each other. Church is so bound up, she needs to have a bowel movement. Amen? True. There needs to be something happening in there. Move it. Amen? Release it. <laughs> I'm being honest. Hey, I mean, Jesus taught in parables of the body all the time. This is the household I live in. Marry somebody from the medical industry. You're going to have all kinds of in- interesting conversations. About the human anatomy. But think about this. If this body, any church, any organization allows excuses, it will eventually dam up the move and flow of God. It will dam up the relationships God wants to give you and how he wants to use you in other relationships. See, what happens is the connecting factor gets broken. Broken marriages, broken relationships, busted up churches. All because of excuses. Amen? That's how it happens. It's how it happens, my friends. Look at this. Go to Zechariah 4.6. Not just look at the overhead. It says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. If we're allowing the Spirit of God to work this out on our behalf, we have a pliable, flexible heart we have a good attitude concerning others even that have wronged us and we do what paul says forgetting those things which are behind greatest thing that needs to happen in the body of christ get a paper shredder and everybody that's wronged you zip zip and shred the past behind you if jesus set you free from yours he has the power to set others free as well amen so let us be a proponent of that that's good preaching darren i like your words man Look at this quote. Knowledge is essential and strength is a must. But his spirit will take us places we never thought possible. His spirit will take us places we never thought possible. There was a bright young man said that. Look. It's a joke. Come on, people. My goodness. See, I'm a proponent of planning, organizing, prioritizing. 
and I'm also a proponent of this, and I think this is my greatest quality, is to hear what Holy Spirit is wanting to do. And then, literally, being flexible enough to put my agenda down and let His come to the forefront. There isn't a church, you can ask my wife, because she's always with me, that I've not preached in, or a leader that I've not been called upon, and I go to help, that I don't sit with her, and I, I just go, drop. I don't know how to help them. I don't know what they need, but let's pray, because Holy Spirit will tell us. When she drives me there, I don't drive for a reason. Because I need to hear clearly what God wants to say to these people and how He wants to help them. See, sometimes when we have an agenda, we'll end up with just that, our agenda. But isn't it so much better when we allow God's agenda to unveil itself, make itself available, and then function in it? Amen? I can't tell you how many times messages get changed that God gave me on the way to the building. I'm telling you right now. One time I was so displeased, I was so upset and distraught is the word. I was supposed to speak and, and I looked at my wife. She goes, what are you preaching on? And I, I go, I don't have the faintest idea. And I'm scared because this is unfamiliar. to me. She goes, Darren, trust me. I go, I don't think I'll have anything to say. She goes, that will never happen. Freed me right there, amen. Just give God place to do what you and I cannot do. That's the key, amen. Second Corinthians nine eight. I'm almost finished. And God is able. We never can forget God is able to make all circle that all grace abound to you. That always having all sufficiency in everything. Our prayer in the Goodman household is, Lord, I thank you that you give us a grace, all grace, and we have all sufficiency for everything you call us to. We've always prayed that. Amen. Even when we didn't, we still act like we prayed that and we got it. Amen. You may have an abundance for every good deed. Philemon 1.6 says this, and I pray that the fellowship of your faith, look at that, the question I have is, who or what are you fellowshipping your faith with? If it's the word of God, it will produce what God's word says. Amen. That the fellowship of your faith may be effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. Everything we do, is it not for Christ's sake? Be guarded on this. Oh, yeah, you know, everything I do is for Christ's sake, but not theirs, not what they do. Let's don't be that kind of people. That's critical. That's judgmental. And it may not even be the truth. Let's just give people some latitude. Let's just believe if they are, you know, funky monkey, you know, dirty, rotten scoundrel. Let's just believe, you know what? God's working some things out for his sake. Amen. So whatever we do, we do for Christ's sake. Does that make sense? Amen. Look at that. And I pray that your fellowship, the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. You're his ambassador. You're his light in this earth. If truth should come, hope, faith, it should come through you. Amen. Close your Bibles. That's the first miracle for today. Amen. Praise God.